or the past decade. Installed global solar cell capacity has expanded year after year, powered by falling prices and improving the performance of solar panels, driving fossil fuel manufacturers out of the market via technological innovation. The capacity factor of solar cells hit 630,000 megawatts at the end of 2019, an incredible amount that will continue to climb in the future decades. However, there has been a hidden fault sapping potential electricity from photovoltaic cells for the past 40 years that we've been utilizing solar cells. Newly made solar cells have a conversion efficiency of roughly 20% in the lab, indicating they can transform 20% of their energy input from sunshine into electric current. Following hours of operation, however, that efficiency would decline to 18%. A 10% decline in overall electric generation or a loss of 10% of 630,000 megawatts of power is actually a significant issue. This is roughly similar to the electricity capacity of 30 nuclear power reactors. There's a lot of potential electricity being lost if the solar panels could run all day, which they can't, but you get an idea. It's no surprise that scientists and engineers have spent the last 40 years trying to figure out what's causing this problem, known as light-induced deterioration. Last year, we thought we'd crack the code and figured out what was causing this unexplained power outage. To comprehend it, we must first comprehend how photovoltaic cells function. The photovoltaic effect is used to generate current in solar cells. When photons with a specific threshold frequency strike a substance, electrons gather enough energy to break away from their atomic orbits and circulate freely through the material. Semiconductors, with their unique features that bridge the gap between conductors and insulators, are the greatest choice for this. Selenium was used to make one of the very first solar cells. These gadgets had to cope with fossil fuel power supplies if they were to be successful. Before the photovoltaic effect could rule the entire planet, scientists and engineers would have to figure out how to boost efficiency while using less expensive materials. Silicon a common semiconductor material is the Electronic Ages Foundation. For our solar cell, this will be the beginning material. To begin, consider what happens when light is incident with a pure silicon crystal. Incoming light can be bounced, consumed, or simply passed through it in one of three ways. The photovoltaic effect cannot be created when light is reflected or passed through. The first step toward increasing efficiency is to reduce the quantity of light reflected by the material. This is quantitative energy that has a negative impact on our productivity. In reality, untreated silicon reflects 30% of the light that hits it. As a result, our maximum efficiency is reduced to 70% before we even begin. As a result, silicon is frequently coated with a coating of silicon monoxide, which can cut the amount of light reflected by up to 10%. The photovoltaic effect is only possible when light is absorbed, not all light to permit us to freely move in the material. We require photons with higher energy than threshold energy. Multiplying Planck's constant by the frequency of a photon yields its energy. The photovoltaic effect is produced by photons of 1.1 electron volts, which equates to a wavelength of 1,110 nanometers in silicon. The atom will just vibrate and heats up as a result of this light. The visible spectrum accounts for 44% of the total, whereas their infrared spectrum accounts for 52%. Although infrared has less energy than visible light, it covers a larger spectrum and thus contributes to more energy. Because silicon can't utilize light with a wavelength longer than 1,110 nanometers, anything after that is energy that can't be converted into electricity. This accounts for roughly 19% of the energy that reaches the planet. It's also worth noting that higher energy light does not produce more electrons, rather it produces higher energy electrons. The energy content of blue light is nearly double that of red light. However, the extra energy released by blue light is merely lost as heat, with no more electricity being produced. About 33% of the energy in the sunshine is lost as a result of this loss. As a result, the loss of spectrum alone resulted in a 52% reduction in inefficiency. It takes a lot of energy to waste this much energy. Silicon, on the other hand, is close to the ideal threshold frequency for balancing these two energy losses, catching enough of the reduced energy wavelengths while not losing too much effectiveness due to the material heating up. 
This is such a significant waste of power that's active cooling, which uses some of the electricity generated by the panels to cool them, actually leads to more electricity being produced in some regions. After that, we'll go on to the following issue. In our circuit, simply releasing an electron does not result in an electrical current. It just allows an electron to move about the substance freely. We must push this electron around an external circuit where it may perform work to generate a useful current. When an electron is liberated, it is replaced by a positively charged hole that is equally free to move around the material. When an electron comes into contact with a hole, it just fills it, wasting energy. The next step in increasing efficiency is to reduce the number of opportunities for electrons to fill these holes by forcing them into our circuit as rapidly as feasible. We accomplish it by utilizing silicon's special features. We can manipulate this behavior and tailor the crystal's material properties by adding impurities called dopants. Silicon has four electrons in its outer shell, so it tends to form a crystal structure with four adjacent atoms using covalent bonds, a bond in which neighboring atoms share an electron pair. Assume boron atoms are added to a silicon crystal wafer. The boron atoms have three electrons accessible for connecting with the silicon crystal, while the silicon crystal requires four. As a result, a hole in the crystal is created, which is looking for an electron to fill it. Because it possesses positive charge carriers, it is referred to as p-type. Assume we make a new silicon wafer. But this time we add atoms with five electrons ready for bonding, such as phosphorus, which connects with silicon once again, but this time with an extra electron that can float easily about the substance. Because it possesses negative charge carriers, it's known as an n-type. Let's see what occurs if we combine these two materials. Positive holes and negative electrons travel towards one another, with electrons becoming p-types and holes becoming n-types. Because the p-type now has more negative charges and the n-type now has more positive charges, this generates a charge imbalance. We've just built an electromagnetic valve that only permits electrons to flow in one direction. Let's have a look at how this pans out. If a sufficiently enough photons penetrates the p-type side of the solar cell and breaks one electron loose, the electron will begin to bounce around the material, and one of two things will happen. It can either recombine with the hole to produce no current, or it can enter the electromagnetic field at the material's junction. The electron is accelerated across the junction into the n-type site, where there are few holes to fill, thanks to electromagnetic forces. Furthermore, the electromagnetic field of the junction prohibits the electron from returning to the opposite side. On the n-type side, holes are preferentially carried across the junction before they can recombine. This results in one side of the junction becoming negatively charged while the other becomes positively charged, resulting in a potential difference or voltage. These electrons will move along the circuit to recombine with the holes on the opposite side if we introduce some metal contacts and an external load circuit. We've just made a solar cell. However, there is a flaw here. By attaching metal connections to the solar cell's upper surface, we have effectively barred light from entering the cell, lowering its efficiency. In their attempt to improve solar cell efficiency, experts have had to consider yet another issue. To design the electric contacts, one research study used topology optimization. Topology optimization employs algorithms to design optimization of objects based on restrictions provided by the engineer. In the case of electric contacts, this method produces a result that looks strikingly similar to the vasculator of a leaf. A leaf's vasculator does not accomplish photosynthesis. Rather, it transports the water required for photosynthesis to the leaf and separates the beneficial products, similar to how electric currents function. Most solar cells, however, have a simple grid structure since it is less expensive to produce. This often leads to an 8% reduction in efficiency. As a result of these phenomena, a typical contemporary solar cell has a laboratory tested efficiency of 20%. So what happened to create the 18% drop after only a few hours of operation? Hundreds of scientific publications were written about this subject, and many of them provided solutions. Many people noticed that the efficiency loss was linked to the amount of boron and oxygen in the silicon, and it didn't happen when boron was replaced with gallium. 
As a result, it was determined that the problem was caused by boron oxygen flaw. Others discovered that by warming the silicon in the shade of 200 degrees for 30 minutes, the flaws might be rectified. However, when exposed to light, it would return. Efforts to address the problem have mostly focused on lowering the concentration of oxygen impurities in silicon wafers, which occur as a result of silicon manufacturing technology that accounts for 95% of silicon solar cells. Little was understood about the defect generating process and how it was producing such a substantial reduction in efficiency, putting engineers with less knowledge to work with when trying to remedy the problem. Congratulations on making it to the end. Let us know what are your opinions on the solar panels in the comments section below. Thanks for watching guys and just before you leave, make sure to give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel if you want to see more content like this one. Take care and I look forward to seeing you in the next video.